Welcome to the Fat Field Family Podcast, where every week we talk about things like nutrition, training, how to live a healthy and active lifestyle with your little ones, peaceful parenting, education, and of course, mindset. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Keto Counterculture, at Fat Field Mom, and at Fat Field Kids, and search for Fat Field Family on YouTube. To stay up to date with everything we're doing, sign up with your email at www.fatfuel.family and check out our blog for workouts, meal ideas, and all the other cool stuff we love to talk about. Don't forget to hit subscribe. All right, welcome to the Fat Fuel Family Podcast. I'm Danny Vega, and today I'm joined by my beautiful and stressed wife, Maura. What's up? (laughs) Do I sound stressed? No, actually don't. It's pretty amazing. Like, I think when we get into the recording, I think it calms us. uh, Fake it till you make it. (laughs) (laughs) How was your weekend? It was fun. It was fun, but intense because we were at Disney for the last time ever. No, I'm just kidding. We'll probably go back. We love Disney, but it's just a little intense right now in life to be going there. It's just hot and the lines and yeah, the and we're things. just we're not happy. We're not having a magical experience, and we've been there for like six years as pass holders, and so it's time to switch to Universal. It just is, and it's time to just take a little bit of a break in general, and then we'll probably switch to Universal for a little bit. Yeah, after after like several months, we'll probably go to Universal in February. Yeah, we'll I just want to make it. sure that because we've been so busy that we haven't even been using our passes, and I don't want to. I just don't want to waste money, you know, like. Yeah. It's like and you're paying that, for these though, passes and you're not going. On top of that, it's been the last year and a half, it's been a huge growth in, in, in pass holders and, you know, people at the parks, even in the down times. And um, a few things we're not happy with, like they're charging us for parking now and there's just a bunch of stuff. And they have all just, these new rides all the time, but you can never go on them yeah. because the lines are ridiculous. Like, and it's hard to get a fast pass because they they give more benefits to the people who are booking hotels well here's the thing this time we didn't even get we booked a hotel this time but since it was only for one night because we had this problem we were trying to get flight of passage which is like the very popular and amazing it's a beautiful and amazing ride uh it's brand new to the avatar land pandora but um we couldn't even get those this time because they said that they actually um had to start giving priority to people who stayed like four nights or longer or something that's what they told that's what they told us yeah sorry guys we just so we just didn't make the cut with our one night stay <laughs> so so anyways you know yeah, it's just very very, very exhausting and so so hot right now and you know we're just we're a little stressed both of us are. yeah and i just don't feel that good today because i just when i'm thing. eating even if i'm eating meat when i'm eating out I can't control what's, you know, how things are getting cooked, how things are being seasoned. And I don't make this stuff up, guys. I feel like I'm dying. She doesn't want to feel like crap. Look at this. I'm look at, you know what I look like, but you know what I look like. That's a little bit more than, because yesterday I was telling her that she had absolutely no bloating and that she would look beautiful and she looked perfect. And of course that doesn't matter. No. Honestly, that doesn't, what I say does not matter at all, but I still had to tell her. But today I woke up extra bloated and. I can't make this stuff up. My body is just like, no, no. I think it's also the stress, you know, the cortisol probably um, through the roof right now. Probably a little bit of like water retention too. You're like not, you're drinking as much water as you can, but there's, it's not as, it's not, it's not enough. There's no yeah. way it's enough, you know? So, yep. so there's that. And we're honestly also a little bit stressed if we're being honest, because we're really intimidated by this episode because this has been... Six, seven years in the, about seven years in the making. And we'll yeah. get into like, uh, you know, our whole thought process the whole time. But we, we both know, like when someone asks us about, and a lot of time they're asking Mauda, they're like, you know, I want to homeschool, teach me or something. It's just like, wait a second. There's so much, there's so many books, there's so many podcasts, audiobooks, um, articles, everything. And so what we've been telling ourselves is that, this is going to be a subject that we continue to learn more about and focus in on specific subjects for different episodes. But we want to, as much as possible, give you a, a holistic introduction into our philosophy on education. Right. 
So this episode is going to be our education episode. I feel like we should say the podcast episode number, but I don't know what number this will be. This is... Uh, <laughs> We're getting there. Five or six. It might be five or six, so you guys will. I should out. know because I have all album art for the first seven um, That's okay. episodes. That's okay. Um, but yeah, so we're going to get into a little bit about our, um, education philosophy, how we came to have these opinions or thoughts on education and a little bit more information on, you know, unschooling, because there are many ways to homeschool. So, um, I know that that confuses a lot of people when I say that word, I can't even tell you how many deer and headlights looks I've gotten before. They're like, what? I'm like, forget it. (laughs) Okay. So it's going to be episode six confirmed. (laughs) Fun times. All right. So should we start with... Start with our, our backgrounds. All again. right. I, uh, I'll start with mine just quickly. I don't want to get too into it because I don't want to get angry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I'm over it. Every I feel like I had to have this experience so that I could know and do better. That's just what we... That's what life's all about. So Winners don't lose. They learn. Yeah. So I... Went to public school my entire life. Um, I was always good at school. It was something that was fairly easy for me, especially in elementary. I don't ever remember struggling in any way. Um, so I guess it's safe to say I'm pretty smart. You think I'm pretty smart? Of course you think are. I'm a smart person? Absolutely. Okay, so I'm a smart person. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I got good grades, but I truly don't measure. I don't think that that's a good measure of how you know intelligent someone is. Um, But I did get good grades in school, Florida Bright Future Scholarship, and you need a certain GPA and all that. However, I didn't really love my experience after probably middle school, like right when I got there, maybe even fifth grade. I don't know. I I just it's all a blur. But I um, just feel by the time I got to high school, like so much of my time was being wasted in general. Um, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. And spending all that time in classes that you don't really have interest in it's it gets to be exhausting and so senior year I pretty much just did not I did not attend any of my classes I don't think senior year uh senior year is one of those things it's like you've already been accepted to a college and I'm just like I'm gonna dance and that's what I'm gonna do I'm not gonna go to class and your teachers are like, whatever, it's cool. We're going to just pass you so you can leave. <laughs> yeah. And I love that because for you, so many things that, that I've come to discover have been intuitive for you. You know, like your whole life, you've, there's, there's a lot of these things where you're just like, this is not right. And it took me a long time to get to that point where I'm like, you know what? I, I deserve more. And I think a lot of people are, are, are going to be like, well, that's not the, how the real world works. You can't just... You can't just live your life doing what you want. And I'm like, uh, yeah, you can. yes, you can. And that's where we're, that's where our main problem is. We don't, we think that we can't live a life where we do what we want and that's wrong. Yeah. There's that's a lot of totally fear, wrong. a lot of yeah. fear that's uh, put on you. I think like yeah. a lot of pressure to have a certain path, you know, a specific path and everything else is just not Rage. good enough. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, so when I was going to school, it was like college degrees were a thing, like you got to get a college degree. And so now we've created this uh, world where a bachelor's degree doesn't even matter anymore because it's like Everyone an overkill, you know what I mean? Yep. And like, so, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 didn't, I never went to private school or anything. I don't think it would be much better. I just think that the system in general is flawed. Um, many great teachers out there. I can... Well, that's one thing. Not, I mean, not really. Cause well, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to be a good teacher. It is hard to be a good teacher. A lot is going against you. Because you're held back a lot of the... Yeah. You're, you're, you have to follow a certain formula. On- I hear it from my friends. All, all five of my best friends are teachers um, from like really good schools to like bad schools. And they, they can't really do what they love. You know, They're, they have so much pressure from up above for testing and things like that just that are get in the way, really. So that's my little background. I don't want it to go too crazy. And, you know, obviously, what, how do you feel it prepared you for life? Oh, <laughs> yes. I did want to talk about that. I wanted to talk because that's one thing that honestly, like when I got to college, I just I didn't even know what I knew. I'm just like, what am I doing? I just felt so unprepared for life. So it's like you spend all this time in school. And what did you get? I mean, I'm not totally sure, honestly, till this day, because I feel like. 
I, a lot of it was self education that I had to do for myself. So no matter what was taught to me, um, and, and we'll get into this, but like one of the things I always hear about is like, you have to be well-rounded or, or, you know, like well-rounded individuals, but I don't even believe that that's true. I don't, I think even I think with about, school, I did not come out well-rounded because I don't remember anything. I think, I think you become more well-rounded if you have more freedom yeah. because you have more time to, to explore yeah. more interests. Yeah. But my whole point is that like, even if you do force people to like, and you do, cause that's what you do in school is you make everyone take certain classes. There's like your, your required classes. And even if you do, you know, I, I quote unquote learned all this information. I was told all this information. I memorized it for tests, but because I didn't have a true interest for it in my heart, I don't remember it, any of that stuff, you know? So I didn't really come out around it. I still came out liking what I like, Yeah, you know? And, and that's, you know, very similar to me. Um, I always had a problem with math, you know, I, I, I never liked it and I don't use much of it. Funnily enough, like I, I'm good at certain types of math, like real quick on certain types of math, mm-hmm. but a lot of these concepts that I had to learn. And for me, it was also middle school too. I, I was public school my whole life. I went to private school for kindergarten and um, we went bankrupt. So that was out the window. <laughs> and, um, you know, we had, we had some hard times when, when I was young, but we, we came out of it. But I was still like, so I, most of my life I was public school. And um, so I was, I was in public school until the end of seventh grade when I was um, forcibly removed from my public school. <laughs> and so my choices at that point were um, either go to an opportunity school with all the other really, um, at the time, people that were not doing very well or very violent and things like that. Or trouble. get out of the public school system. Um, and basically, that's what my dad did. My dad, the day that I got kicked out of my, my school, he, he put me in my room and I stayed in my room for like, it felt like hours. And he came back and he had all these pamphlets for different private Christian schools. And he's like, pick one. And I picked the one that seemed the most, I don't know, progressive as far as like, you know, the rules weren't bad. And so I picked Florida Christian, (laughs) took the entrance exam, got in. And so I went to a private school in high school. Um, My main thing is that I had interests that I didn't get to spend enough time on you know right. and that's something that i wish i would have because they, that's the time to do it now and they've it's stayed the, the same those interests haven't changed you know yeah. i still love to read i still love to write i could have been doing a lot more of that um the only difference really i don't i wouldn't say that my my school's education was any better than public school other than the fact that the classes were smaller size so i guess there's there's that but uh, there was also censorship. Like we, we would read literature and we would only read excerpts because it didn't fit in line with the, you know, the school's rules on, on that, which to me as a Christian, I still think is wrong because, you know, I, that's just my personal opinion. You know, I don't think we should be censoring as, as long as it's not vulgar. I'm not talking about, you know, pornography. Or I'm not going to be sending. And it depends on the age, I think, like. Not for high school, high you know, school like for kid? high school, you I mean, should read some of that classic literature. Yeah, Come classic on. literature. I a think, lot of this stuff. You, I think you your age is age appropriate. Yeah. So yeah. So, um, you know, I, I was I was very unprepared for everything. Luckily, I had to spend a year in prep school to get into Columbia because my SATs were not high enough originally, and so they sold it to me. The Columbia said, "Listen, when you do your your visit to Columbia." We're going to um, also pay for your visit to the prep school that we actually train at for preseason. And we have a connection there. And, you know, if you go there and um, because it was too late for me to get into that year and it, it made perfect sense, you know, because the person that was starting running back, he was going to be a year older. So it was be a year between us. And um, and I learned more in that one year of prep school than I learned in all of high school because it was designed like a college. You basically picked your, your classes and everything. So that's both of us kind of are on the same page when it comes to, and I think a lot of people would be, and they would say that they, they wish they could have gotten more from their education. And um, it's totally okay to say, hey, I didn't have a good education. It's, it's okay. I, I know that some of us, because of how indoctrinated we are, we feel like it hurts us to say, like to criticize the system that we're in. And um, we've gotten way past that. I have no ties. <laughs> so, um, so what do we want to talk about next? 
um, how we came to our decision. Oh, yeah. So I'll take that one because honestly, from... You were the main factor. I was the main factor because I was going to be the one that was going to have to really be the one implementing it. And I can't lie. Initially, it was always one of those things that I was like, I wish I could be that mom that homeschools. And I feel like most moms think this, you know, like even friends of mine that, oh, I could never homeschool. I don't have patience. I'm like, yeah, I'm the worst. <laughs> I'm the actual worst at patience. I'm pretty bad. Um, but then it just, the more I looked into it and it's, everything changes when you have your own kid. Um, so when Desmond was born <laughs> and this is so weird to me, but it didn't take very long for people to start asking me what school he was going to go to or when he was going to go to school. And he was like one or two. And I would just look at them like, what is going on? I don't, I'm so confused. What does he need to learn right now that I can't teach him? Is he need to, you know, like what? Or that, or that he can't learn himself. Or that he can't learn himself. And, and then also I just thought it was weird. Like he's a baby to me. But like, we had decided before he was born, didn't we? No. We didn't? No, I remember we I went because... to go. No, I was going to go look at Montessori schools, which is what I did. Oh, okay, Montessori. Okay, we were already on that well, pu- okay. at that point. Public school was never an option. That We knew that. I knew that that much. Public school was not an option. That was for sure. That was just not going to be an option for me. But I was trying to look for alternatives. And the problem is, is that Montessori schools are, they are, the idea behind them is genius. Maria Montessori honestly had it figured out. We should have all listened to her. She had it figured out. And if schools would be run that way, we would be a lot better off. However, because there aren't, you know, it's, it's basically a private school. They're just so expensive. They're very, very, very expensive, like 10 grand for like three hours a day. And so I did, I went to visit some of these schools when Desmond was two years old And I saw what they were doing and I was just like, why can't I do this? I don't understand. Like, there's no reason for me to pay someone $10,000 a year for, first of all, three hours a day, which is not even that much of a break. So it's not like I was going to get a break or anything Um, to teach my kid how to like how and and do things that I could totally teach him at home. So I got a little bit. And then also around that time, we were also just like doing massive amounts of research like i mean all we would do on car rides was listen to podcasts listen to john taylor gatto go on for five hours at a time literally literally and we've seen that video multiple times i we will link this video time for us to start to watch again a little bit oh we're gonna watch it again for sure we should watch it like on the tv with the kids let's watch let's watch one hour a night for the for this week yeah yeah um, and so just really, really, um, and honestly, a huge influence was Anna, who, who at the time ran um, her page on Facebook called The Libertarian Homeschooler. And she would post, you know, conversations with her kids that she would have and like talk about how what she would do with them. And like, it was just so intriguing to me. And I was just like, that's what I want. That's that's what I want for my kids. And so um, that's that's how it kind of came to be. And then I just... I kind of never looked back, like, because the, the longer it got and the older they got, I was just like, almost like too late now. <laughs> you know, you know, what's weird. And, and like, I think I, I wonder if people realize that we're telling the truth about like both of you and I have a very strong sense of like justice and yeah. we have a strong sense of like when things are wrong, we have a hard time accepting it. Like, like if there's a better way. We have a hard time, both of us. And now we've, we've gotten better at accepting other people because they're out of our control. But we're both like very committed to say, if something's within my power and I can change it, I I'm going to do it. And we, you know, at that time also, we were, we were learning a lot about, and actually a lot of it was me teaching you too, because a lot of this stuff I had already been believing in. It's so like our philosophy in general about freedom and and living in a voluntary society where people aren't forced to do stuff. And it's just very much tied into. That's an extension of that. It really is. And so we were, we were, we were learning a lot about that stuff. And we're like, then it became clear that it's really hard to raise a child that way if they're not with us. Yeah. You know, because the school system, I'm sure if you go, you know, we, the, the several stages of grief, you know, in the beginning, you're, there's that anger. And so you can look like seven years ago, like, you know, our posts on Facebook were more, you know. Embarrassing. <laughs> but that's what growth is about. Like when you're handling something and you're processing it and social media exists, you process it 
publicly and you're just like, this is wrong and this and that. And, and you know, of course, we, we, we go through that. But um, now we're just like, obviously, we're confident in what we do. And um, and again, like it goes back to like changing the world is within our power, you know. So, you know, the way we see it, uh, we, we, I forget where we heard it originally, but it's like, you know, you have two people who are committed to something and who are on the same page. And then then they raise two other kids and now there's four. Yeah. Those kids marry people that with like who are like minded and now there's 12, you know, like right. it's 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 Yeah, that's this how it works. exponentially changes the way our culture is and we do have we have some thoughts on our culture. We do have again like please don't take it like we don't think that we're better than other people. We don't think that we do have problems that we need to address, you know. I like, want to say something about that. Yeah, yeah. Let's just get that out there. Yeah. Because Let's be honest. I have been accused. We've been accused mo- multiple times of being judgmental. Yeah. But I, I just want to bring light on that word. If anyone, if you've ever made a choice, like you chose half and half over heavy cream, you have been judgmental and you've made a judgment yeah. saying this is better for me right now. And so if you've made any choice, a choice is a judgment. Yeah. Any choice is a judgment. So basically we're all judgmental and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. This is. So it's like, it's just different. Cause I feel like that's like a, like a thing. And like, it's not like we're just sitting here, like judging others. No, we're just saying, this is what's, um, uh, what we think is best. Yeah. And this is what we're going to do. You know, what's really cool though. There, yes, there could be someone who who's listening to this. Who's like, you know, I really like this. I really like this. They're crazy when it comes to that. And like, cool. they create this system that has some of what we have and they take what they like and they leave what they don't. That's, that's good. And we do that too. We do we that do. within, within well, every, everything. Yeah. yeah. So. All right. So uh, let's talk about some of the stuff we read and some of the, and kind of how they impacted us. All right. So we get crazy with it. We go back like and read. We do, we, when we did research on this, like we went back, like back into the 1900s, like where, did school even come from? Why was this thing? And why? Because why? guess what, guys? School's not, it's not, an, it's, it's a kind of a new thing. Yeah, it's very, not, it's a very, pretty much very, 100 years old. It's only like 100 years old, maybe a little bit over that at this point, but it really started in the 1900s. And so we kind of went back, really. Like we really wanted to understand like how this, how this occurred. Like who thought this was a good idea? <laughs> Um, and then when you actually start looking back, it's like not cool what you find sometimes. Well, and, and also it's like it's been, you know, the, the world gets smaller as the Industrial Revolution happens. We start to see what other countries are doing. We're like, hey, that's great. Let's let's bring that. Let's adopt You want to talk a little bit about the history? We might as well just get yeah. that out of the way because so that kind of goes with this. Yeah, let's go. And so the history, we're going to. Because that's where Rothbard and all that comes in. But yeah. So, all right. So I have some quick stats here on the history of school. I didn't want to go too much into statistics. So we have a few. Um, first of all, um, in 1900, 34 states had compulsory schooling laws, which compulsory schooling just means that requiring people to go to school on its face. You think education is important. We need to make people do it just like, you know, this is important. We need to make people do it or this is bad. We need to make sure that people can't do it. That's kind of like the the road to hell, you know, paved with good intentions. And, um, you know, we have 34 states at the time by 1900 that have compulsory schooling laws. And so as a result, by 1910, 72% of American children attended school. And by 1918, exactly 100 years ago, every wow. state required students to com- complete elementary school. So before that, you see like... As early as the 1700s, there's like schools and there are, you know, schools are a thing, but it's not until really the 20th century that we have this whole thing where it's like people start to think, okay, you have to, you have to go to school. Right. So um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, since we're on the stats, get the stats out of the way, because they're so dry. You know, we wanted to talk about like, you know, there's, there's several different ways you can judge um, you know, the, the, a, a country's education, regardless of which, which one you look at, we looked at several, we're anywhere from 15th to like, let's say 20th in the, in the world in education. And that's using the benchmarks and the priorities that we have as a country, which Maura and I don't even agree with, you know, it's like, is this child, are your children doing this by this age? Are they doing that by that age? 
But even by those standards, we're not doing well. And then literacy, uh, 30 million in our 30 million people cannot read, write, or do math above a third grade level. Um, and, you know, as a result, $230 billion in healthcare costs are associated with that because over half of Americans can't read well enough to comprehend health information. So oh what happens is they incur higher costs. So it, it costs money. Does you know? it work? So does it even work? You know yeah. what I mean? So we, we don't want to like spend too much time on that, but we just, we always like to kind of paint a picture of why we do what we do. So back to the books, you know, we, we, we were, we were kind of blown away, both of us by the whole history of it, because the Prussian basically system is the, the system that we've most modeled ourselves after. So if you guys know Prussia, like before there was a Germany, there was, you know, Prussia and it was all these, this surround, those areas. And there was, there was a lot of turmoil and, and wars going on in the you know, past several hundred years. And, you know, if you need to be an effective army, and one thing that Germans are is they are really good planners and they, they are very effective and efficient. I mean, if you go to Germany, I've never been, but I'm told that it's a very well organized society. Um, and that's a cool thing about their culture. You know, you look at some of these cultures, we wouldn't be able to do that stuff because our culture is just different. Um, and so they thought of a system that would basically take these people out of the countryside and educate them to prepare them to be soldiers. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was something that we saw uh, as a country um, and the people up top saw and they thought, you know, that's that can be a good thing. Now. Why don't you talk about the education board and read at least some excerpts because that's very enlightening because that's kind of like <laughs> the original, um, you know, big philanthropists and tycoons of this country, the Rockefellers of the world, the Carnegie's, all those people were invested in um, shaping our society. And, you know, don't, let's not put our tinfoil hats on. Let's let's assume intentions are good. No, I don't know about that. <laughs> well... <laughs> All right. Here's I got the thing. my hat on. Sorry. Well, here's the thing. Here, here's the thing. Like, let's look at it both ways, right? Because the other thing about that is, like, if you read that whole thing, that I'm not going to read that whole thing. I know, but there are times where it says there are exceptions to what you're going to say, right? And they say that, and I'll, I'll I'll clarify if if it's not made clear by what you say. But I also do want to mention this because I heard it in a podcast when they were talking about this a long time ago. Is that this was written? before social media and these people had no idea that this would get out so they could yeah, say whatever these are they minutes wanted from a meeting these are so like these a are private like, meeting closed doors mm -hmm. uh like rockefeller all these people carnegie all these people had things had charles something murray to, I had something is, to do with it mm -hmm. yeah. they were all part of the general education board um okay let me see where i've okay i'm not going to read this whole thing i will post a link to this guys yep um but this is just a little excerpt uh, the present educational conventions Fade from our minds and unhampered by tradition, we work our own goodwill upon a grateful and responsive rural folk. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or of science. We are not to raise up from among them authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryo great artists, painters, musicians, nor Will we cherish even the humbler ambition to raise up from among them lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statesmen, of whom we now have ample supply? We are to follow the admonitions of the good apostle who said, Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low degree. And generally, with respect to these high things, all that we shall try to do is just to create presently about these country homes an atmosphere and conditions such that if by chance, a child of genius should spring up from the soil. That genius will surely bud and not be blight blighted. Blighted. blighted yep. Putting, therefore, all high things quite behind us, we turn with a sense of freedom and delight to the simple, lowly, needful things that promise well for rural life. For the task that we set before ourselves is a very simple as well as a very beautiful one to train these people as we find them for a perfectly ideal life just where they are. Yes, ideal, for we shall allow ourselves to be extravagant since we are only dreaming. Call it idyllic. Yep. If you like an idyllic life under the skies and within the horizon, however narrow, where they first open their eyes. So. I have to say something about that because 
it's so condescending. It's and very it's, condescending. And it, and it happens that all sounds the time. very condescending to me. Still, to this day, <laughs> you see people and they don't, they don't catch themselves and they don't realize what they're saying. But there, there's this talk of, you hear this sometimes, why can't we go to the good old days before the Industrial Revolution? Like, why can't we go to where, you know, people, you know, they, they, they work the land and they provided for themselves because it was hell. It was pure hell. And when these people are saying, why can't we go back to that? I can guarantee you they're not expecting themselves to be the ones to do that. No. They're expecting someone else to right. do it for them and raise those crops and do those things and, and get those calluses on their hands and, and work under the sun because it's a simple thing. It's like the noble savage. Like the noble savage is harmless. He's dumb, but he's so happy. Yeah. And well, let's make them happy where they are. Let's not uh, ask them for, to not, strive for yeah, more and, yeah. and to, to dream and to do all these things. And that is the origin of the management system of education in this country, which is a management system. And again, because of the Industrial Revolution, yep. where, didn't we have a lot of like we had a lot of immigrants coming in at the time yep. and they needed a way to like create normalize worker and, uh, bees, basically, yeah. and, and get them, you know, acclimated to our culture, our language. And dare I say obedient? Yeah. But yes. Well, I mean, if you look at it, it even says that somewhere in one of those essays, like yeah. obedience is used as a term. And it's important because you, you want to accustom these people just kind of like what uh, Herbert Spencer says. If you, if you want to make people slaves, you gotta, you gotta treat them, get them used to it, you know? Yeah. From when and they're young. Yeah. If you don't want to raise a slave, then you, you cannot, you, you can't, can't treat them that way. Treat them like a slave and then expect them to not be a slave. And, um, these people, um, they, they had to get them acclimated. They had to get them. And that's why we have very similar to like the factory where the factory would have alarms and, you know, you work at your station, you go to the next one. That's how a classroom is built around bells and, and you know, typical like conditioned response, like go to your classroom, sit down, do your thing, go to the next classroom, do your thing. Now, again, you can say that I'm crazy and that I'm I'm a <laughs> I'm a tinfoil hat wearing dude, but even if I'm even if we're just talking about the fact that it's not with bad intentions, this is what you're trying to do is you're trying to get people used to a certain way of life. Yeah. And so you know that's the the history. That's that's just the the t the, tip the tip of the, of the iceberg. iceberg. But um, we have several books. Um, one of my favorite people of all time is a man named Mary Rothbard who uh, w went to Columbia, like me, and who was actually um, denied his doctorate there for several years because he was, he was, he's the original rebel, man. That guy. Because he wasn't doing the what state. they wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he wrote an essay called Education Free and Compulsory. And he talks about the differences between a free education and one that's uh, compulsory. That's a big one. Mauda read Weapons of Mass Instruction. I read Education Free and Compulsory as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. You read that too, of course. It's free that was on an Mises. Essay. That's, That's a, the Mises best thing org about it. is a fantastic um, resource for you for philosophy, uh, lots of lots of free books and free essays. They make everything free. It's all intertwined. Um, then Weapons of Mass Instruction. Um, the Greatest History Lesson by John Taylor Gatto is pretty much our favorite resource for this because it's five hours of him being interviewed by someone and you get to see this man's genius as he's talking and he's saying facts, figures, years, dates off the top of his head, off the top of his head. And then the, the references are flashing on the screen. So you can go down 5,000 rabbit holes there, but it's important because who's John Taylor Gatto. Oh yeah. So why don't you, uh, well, I'll tell them really quick. I tell them who it is. And then I think it's, I think it's an appropriate time to, to go into the, I quit, I think. Cause that's yeah. Really so John Taylor Gatto was um, a public school teacher in New York City. He, I'm pretty sure he taught middle school too. I remember him talking about a lot about 13 year olds, which is mm -hmm. that's not easy. But um, he won Teacher of the Year multiple times. And, state and city. Yeah, state and city uh, until they found out what you know how he would go about his education and his curriculums for children. Which, by the way, he gave every child in his class something different for them to do because wow. We are all different, aren't we? It's so crazy how that works. Yep. Yeah, we all have to sit there in class learning the same things, you know? So, you know, he has some crazy stories and you should read, you should watch his, because that's another thing he goes into in the greatest history lesson. He starts talking about like random experiences with certain oh, children that he had. And the stories are just incredible. And it's just incredible to see what happens when you actually give children 
an opportunity. Like it's like they do surprise you, but we like we really. Oh, and he talks about this a lot, which is another big thing that I don't love about schools is that we extend childhood. So that's another thing. Oh, like yeah, schools, schools now, schools now go until we're eighteen, but that's not how it was. Like before. Back in the days, like Ben Franklin, he was like 12 years old and he had like an up and running business. Two, two businesses, no? Yeah, two businesses two, with no cell phone. Business, yeah. He would be like on the train miles, miles away from home with no cell phone to call his mommy. And he's like 12 years old. Um, there was someone else, I forget, another famous, Edison? Edison. He had well. like, he ran like a farm. Like he had employees, Wasn't over 100 he, uh, employees. Which one of them was a boat captain? Oh gosh, I can't remember now. Someone you guys got to watch this. Yeah, like we might get these facts. <laughs> yeah, at like 12 years old. Yeah. And 12 is a, is, a, is a magical year, apparently. It is a magical year, but now it's like you have 18-year-old babies that like can't do anything. And, and we I felt there. that way, yeah, yeah, we you know? There. And it's just like this extension of childhood where you're literally 18 years old and you're like, can I use the restroom? Like, what? You know? So it's just like this ex- artificial extension of childhood is creating this culture of like... And I let me know. let me add something because I I always think about like what we're saying and how it can be per, how it can be um, interpreted. <laughs> interpreted. And um, our thing is not get to work, kid. You're 12. It's time to go to work. No, 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 no. That's not what it is. It's stop telling kids what do you want to be when you grow up. It's what do you want to be? What do you want to do? Why why do you have to wait? I saw my friend Ben uh, Ben Bukowski shared a, a a quote today about. You know, why aren't people running like they're on fire towards their goals? Like, let's go. There's no time to wait. Let's 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 go now. Um, and so. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there because my four year old was uh, scratching on our door. So um, basically what we're saying is that there's no reason for you to have to postpone following your dreams. There's no reason for you to to put off starting a business. Desmond started a business when, how old was he? Four, three or four? Yeah, like or four or five. Four or five. He started his first business. It was called Galaxy Dreamcatchers. He basically took sticks from the YMCA where he played soccer. He would bring them home. He would create dream catchers and create like different shapes. So some would be a square, some would be a triangle, circle. Then he would paint them and he would sell them to people all across the country and he made hundreds of dollars, and, and that's how he bought his first bearded dragon. And um, that's 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 awesome. Yeah, he, yeah. he knows now. Like he can, he he's empowered to be like, if I don't have something that I want, or if I, you know, I can actually make that happen. I can create it's something. Such a good lesson, yeah. you know. Yeah, like you don't have to wait to have a job or whatever. But that's like another thing that kind of where our culture kind of plays a role because it's like kids aren't allowed to like do lemonade stands anymore. Yeah. There's like a lot of like weird things that get in the way and I don't know, but all right, what's next? So <laughs> let's talk about, you know, we, we want to talk about before we get into like the real nuts and bolts of what we do, we wanted to take some time to talk about how we define success. And we both um, wanted to share like kind of our things, which we're on the same page, but we're just you know, different words or whatever. So why don't you talk about how you define success? Okay. So I'm, for me, success is just finding out who you are, what you love and using that to make the world a better place. Um, and that's the thing, you know, like success is different. It can mean different things to everyone and you have to define what that is. Yeah. And, and, um, the beautiful thing about that is that once you, um, once you know really what you love, then you have to decide, okay, there are things that people love that may not make a lot of money. And that's okay if they're okay with that decision. Exactly. So like does the pain of not having the freedom to buy certain things, does that outweigh your, your pain that you would have if you weren't doing what you feel like you love so much? I would say probably for a lot of people it doesn't, you know, because most people were going to say, at least if they thought about it enough, they would say, you know what, I, I really love this and this is, this is what I'm going to do. And, and if I'm the best in the world, maybe I will make a lot of money. But, you know, regardless, there, there's, there's lots of ways to make a living. And, um, and so, you know, defining success is huge because we usually define success as these little benchmarks like how are they doing on this week's tests? How are they doing this year? What are, where are they according to their peers? Like where, where are they ranked and all this stuff? And we're like, wait, wait. What, what are they like? 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's, and so for me, it was like, you know, same thing, know who you are, know what you love. And I, you know, I love Joseph Campbell's thing. If you guys don't know who Joseph Campbell is, he's a um, historian and he's an expert on mythology and he's just got very interesting views. And he talks about following your bliss and it's, it can be interpreted the wrong way because following your bliss does not mean that life is going to be pure bliss. Following your bliss means that you follow what makes you happy and there's going to be, there's going to be lots of challenges. And he talks about the role of myth throughout history as social commentary on the struggles we face. Like every hero has a struggle. Look at Odysseus, look at all the big, you know, the dramas, the, the, all the huge literary works and everything. All of our heroes, they, they, they have this bliss that they want to follow, but they have struggles. And, and that's what, the same thing for us. So now that we've defined, you know, how we want to succeed, um, now we can talk about why we do what we do. Right. So why do we, these are going to be all the reasons why. And there's not, I, it's not a holistic no, list, but we just, we, just we like a, a few, few, a few main things. Why like the important things for me, why I love what we do. And it's like, you don't see it until I'm starting to see it now. It does, you know, cause it does, it takes a while to get your results when you do it this way but then it's just so much more meaningful so number one is hilarious to me because people we chose this one to i be chose this one, one to be to be annoying specifically <laughs> sorry <laughs> so um i love the socialization aspect of homeschoolers yeah which is funny because that's everybody's number one concern like the number one thing that i get asked about the most is what about socialization i'm like it's so great actually that's actually my favorite part of homeschooling the term homeschooling also suggests that you're at home sitting around the table in your overalls like some people are cool i'm not yeah. and if they are that's cool too you know but that homeschooling suggests that you're just home like we're never home so here's the thing. We're out and about in the real world, quote unquote. That's another thing I've gotten. Yeah, what about real the real world? world? I'm like, oh, world. I'm sorry. I didn't know I was segregated by age in the real yeah. world. But um, my kids are out in the real world all day and they're getting their social cues from me, which sometimes is not good because sometimes I act horrible. But again, there's a lot of growth that happens with that, you know, because you're it's more in your face. You know, you can only blame yourself. But my kids are not getting their social cues from only their from, from kids only kids their age like only their peers and that happens you know what i mean so it's like you're just getting your if if i were to put dean in school he's gonna get his social cues from all the other three and four year olds he's around you know instead of getting them from me from other adults or even children that are older from his brother you know um just getting social cues from all types of ages so it's like i don't know it just i love it and that's one of the biggest compliments that i do get with desmond is like oh he's he speaks so well he talks to me like he's and that's another thing like that I've noticed, like Very no matter what, no matter what, because it, it just ends up this way where, you know what I mean? Like when you're in school, like I remember like it's like the adults and then the kids, like there's not a lot us of like, them. it's us versus them. Yeah. And so there's not a, like my, my son has like no problem going up to any adult, like talking to them. Like they're just another person, you know, like there's no crazy authoritarian figure. So that's one of my favorite things about it what about you well i love the socialization aspect you know because um i think the other reason why people you know think homeschool kids are awkward it's because um unfortunately our, our education system doesn't address the needs of several children you know and so these kids are left with the choice of homeschooling so a lot of kids who are on the autism spectrum a lot of kids who have learning disabilities i hate that word because it's, it's basically you know some people do have I don't know, I guess learning disabilities, but then no, it's real. Dyslexia it's, it's is a like real a real thing. thing and... But there, but there are, there are different ways for them to pick up that information that are not the ways they're being taught. And so because they can't, they're not equipped to do that. Um, the kid, the child has, has to go somewhere else to a private tutor or to homeschool. And so what ends up happening is if you grew up and you saw a kid that was homeschooled, that was awkward you automatically assume that all kids who are homeschooled are awkward when in reality it's the fact that the awkward child or the child was different before they went to homeschool now nowadays that's changed i think because homeschool grows by 
you know, double digit percentages every year. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, th- there's lots of more and more people homeschooling. I'm seeing p- friends of mine pulling kids out of school left and right. And so socialization is a huge thing because, you know, you're, you're going to, you're, first of all, we spend so much time with them. You know, we're at home with them. We're out and about with them. But in reality, it's two adults and two kids. Then when they're at the, you know, when they're at the gym, there's still, there's tons of kids, but there's also several adults. There's just so many situations. And then I was a very social child and I was punished by, for that. I always got bad conduct grades. I always got. Well, what do they tell you when you're in school? Yeah. You're not here to socialize. Exactly. It's like, I don't understand. If yeah. you do, you get a bad grade. Yeah. In conduct. Yeah. So it doesn't even make sense, that argument, really. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, then, you know, it's so, you know, some people will say, well, how your kid, how's your kid going to be street smart? How are your kids going to know what's going on in the world? Don't worry. I got that. That's that's our job, too. That's 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 seeding your your responsibility to someone else. And with 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 something such as all of the important topics in life, I want them to hear it from me. You know, I, I, I do. And, you know, that I have no problem admitting that. And there's you know, there's appropriate times in their development for them to know Certain about things. these things. Yeah. And their brains are not ready for for that, you know, to process some of those things. And so we have the choice to do you know, to talk about these things. And we will, we absolutely will. And we'll talk about a lot of things that aren't talked about in school too, you know, real, um, all the sides of history, all the, you know, the good, the bad, we, we should talk about those things. We mm-hmm. want to get a full picture of what really went on. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we tailor stuff and we customize it to the child's needs. This is where, again, I talked about this before. It's, it's, unfortunately just an ineffective system because you have to take 25 30 40 kids and you have to manage them and keep them together and make sure that they're all moving right around the same pace so that you can pass them on to the next teacher who's going to pass them on to the next teacher and um you know i was talking about this with maura yesterday as we were coming back from disney on our car ride we were talking about the fact that we spend a lot of time with our kids and I, and I love that. That's a very important very close. thing. Yeah, the connection. I know my child very, very well, and I, and I love that. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's the other thing. Why don't you, you know, talk about, you know, the last one where we, we've mentioned it. But Okay, so another reason why I love homeschooling um, is because we don't have any arbitrary benchmarks. Um, I don't believe in that. I, don't, I think that that's one of the flaws of, of schools is that we group by age and not abilities or by interests. So... In a way, like if, if I could change schools, like that's one thing that I would change that I think would make it better. And I think I think people would agree with me. I mean, what's there not to agree on? So it's like if children are learning to read, it's like if let's say you have a child who is advanced. Now that they have to wait for their peers. I get that, you know, some teachers might give extra work, but I feel like it's just not going to be enough. You know, like not, I know some I people friend, really need to be challenged yeah. like in certain areas. And it's just you're not going to have the time. You have too many other students to, to, to deal with. And and then like if someone's not catching up, well, guess what? That person is going to get put in a remedial class. They're going to think they're dumb and they're not. They're just not good at reading right now and maybe not developmentally ready yet because we're all ready at different times. Just like some babies walk at nine months, some babies walk at 15 months. It's the same with these things. And so it's like kids who are ahead got 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 a whole got to wait and then like the ones that aren't, you know, get held back. And it's just push, like, we should gotta push them. It's you all gotta, it's like a push them. Like a school of and fish. then it's like super stressful too. It's just like stressful for these kids. So that's one thing that I love. I'm not like, I'm not um, held down by these, by these benchmarks, you know, like it doesn't make me feel and neither is my child. Yeah. And, and we would never, you know, um, the one thing that we do w- with Desmond, like we, we do want him to learn how to read and he's, he's on the, he's, he's on the road to reading you know, it's a, it's funny because in reading, he's ahead with some things, he's behind with other things. But for for us, is we want him to open this whole new world because he's such a curious kid. Um, but we're not bothered that he's behind or certain things like that. We're just not. And 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 if you're a parent of a homeschooled child, you need to definitely prepare yourself for that to to and trust let go of that. in the process yeah and just and like know. all those little fantasies you have because yeah cuz cuz just... if you like if you do your uh, you know algebra you know at 7th grade or you do it in ninth grade or whatever like the differences between years at the end you know especially if it's going to take 2 weeks to do it in ninth grade versus like 
eight months to do it in seventh grade because the child's not ready and you're forcing them to do it, you know, that's okay. That's a real good thing. And guess what? In the end, nobody remembers algebra. (laughs) Not the ones that were good at it or the ones that were bad at it. Unless, Because here's the thing. Like you were saying earlier, how you were bad at math. Well, I'm not. I'm actually really good at math. Like, I'm always like, why is this so hard for you guys? I don't understand. But guess what, guys? Give me a math test right now. I don't know. I can't pass an algebra test or calculus. And I took calculus. I did well. But I can't pass that test right now. Why? Because I'm not using this information in my everyday life. So it doesn't even really matter. And so, yeah, these arbitrary benchmarks are just, I don't like it. So what else? Well, What's um, next? before we talk about what it looks like for us, like on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, we wanted to mention a little bit just we, the, the, the label that we have as unschoolers and what's the difference between that and a typical oh, yes. homeschooler. Mm-hmm. So you want to you want to go into that a little bit? Sure. Um, I don't love the term unschooling because it only talks about like what I don't do and it doesn't say what we do. Um, it just says that we're not because there's a lot. OK, a lot of homeschoolers have curriculum and they are basically kind of like replicating school at home. But it's still better because it's still individualized. No matter what you do, it's going to be individualized. So you can pull from all these different. And here's the thing. Now with the Internet, it's like school has become, I don't know, kind of like obsolete because you can learn anything at any time. If you have a phone, you can learn whatever you want. A lot of lectures for, you know. MIT has their lectures for free. credit classes are available for free. For free online, yeah. So, um. Yeah, the internet has definitely changed homeschooling for sure. But um, what were we just talking about? I lost my train of thought. So unschooling. Oh, unschooling. So the some people do well. Some kids do well with the curriculum. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's where it's awesome. Like maybe, I mean, Dean is still little, but maybe Dean will do well with that. You know, I don't know. But that's why it's so awesome because you can individualize everything to the kid. So unschooling is more of a philosophy on how children learn and the fact that they don't need, oh, I should pull up that that um what was uh that baby thing okay it was something about i saw it was like a tweet that said something like if we were to put babies in school at six months what about walking and teach them how to walk with it it, in one generation people would think that you couldn't learn to walk without going to school (laughs) and so we kind of feel that way with with almost everything like i don't think you need to force someone to read i've seen so many kids learn to read without even being taught you know um and so that's the difference with unschooling. It's just like how children learn. We think that learning is natural. We think that children have to have an internal motivation to learn um, certain things and that it's more meaningful that way. And it's something that they'll retain later on because it wasn't something that was forced on them. Um, it just came natural. So there's a lot of things that homeschoolers know. Or, or Well, wait, I'll say this. There's a lot of information that school children know that homeschoolers will never know but there's also a lot of things that homeschoolers and unschoolers know that school children don't know you know what i mean yeah. it's just different it's just that's how unless, it is unless like after school's done they haven't been completely broken and they still are curious and they want to learn because a, a lot of us tend to like you know after college feel like oh burnt out you know, for sure i was burnt like, out by like the time i got done. there I, I personally i'm just so curious and i want to learn about things and i'm obsessive so i don't do that but a lot of people do and they admit it that they do yeah 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 you know a life of learning i mean everybody talks about anyone who's successful you'll hear them they'll always say you need to life is about learning continuing to learn yeah. you know and we don't i don't you know we don't think we got things figured out we we're always open to like learning new things again making us think about even our, our most, you know, passionate beliefs that we hold dearly, we're open, you know, we're yeah. open to challenge them. I don't think we'll ever be tilt towards anything authoritarian, like, you know, making kids do this or that, you know, but, you know, certain things that we can, we moderate, you know, we change. Um, and so, yeah, th- that's what unschooling is. Um, a lot of kids do very well with the curriculum. And so they, they like the structure, they do well with it, they thrive on it. Um, some kids, they, they need more breaks. That's unschooling is more, it's child, it's child led, you know, we're, Mm -hmm. we're really, it's, it's definitely hard, you know, because it's, there's a huge difference. Anyone who unschools, well, I don't want to speak for other people, but a a lot of the people I know who, who unschool, they are not unparenting. They are 
more involved, if anything, because they're spending so much time looking at the way the child responds to different things that he or she learns. And we are just take, making mental notes and being like asking questions because we, we, we're so focused on that versus like, okay, we're starting with what, what we want them to learn and then, you know, seeing how they do that. I just personally, like sometimes you got to introduce stuff, see if they like it. But yeah, we, yeah, there's definitely a radical form, but you know, we we're not, also we're believe not that like they areas. don't know what they don't know. So it's like we yeah. do introduce them to stuff that we think they might find interesting. But if they don't, I'm not like, well, you need to. Yeah, you need I know to better than you. I know better. Um, all right. So let's talk about what, what does a week look like for us and for the kids? Well, it can be different from week to week. So I try to have like some kind of schedule just because um, it just makes life flow easier. And it's just important. That's just like a good life skill to have is to have a schedule. And um, so let's see. Um, it's actually funny because I don't my kids don't have to wake up but they do well Des does and here's another thing like everyone's different you know so Des will wake up early which is nice because it gives me time and we'll read we'll read a book He's learning to read right now and he'll read a book for how long like at what, it doesn't take that long just, we're literally done at 6 30 a.m so like what like six like 20 minutes yeah 6 10 to 6 30 yeah yeah maybe half an hour tops um, we'll read some books that he likes, uh, however many he can get through. And this then morning he made himself his eggs. He this morning it. he made himself eggs. Um, and then I'll, I'll, we'll go to the gym. And I do realize that not every gym is created equal. So like the gym that I go to, it's very nice. Um, it's something that is worth it for me because since my kids are not in school, it's a place where I can have some help and they will help me with anything that I send, any work that I send. So like I'll send Desmond with them. Um, like we have one of those workbooks and I'll give him a few handwriting pages and they help him out. And he, you know, some, here's the thing. If there's a day that he says he doesn't want to do it, then he doesn't do it. Do you know what I mean? And that's that. Um, now, if I notice a pattern, I'm like, uh, I think you're, you know, I don't know. I think you, you need to work on this because you're going to, yeah, you're sandbagging it. You need to, you need to focus a little bit. But for the most part, he doesn't really, he doesn't mind it. Um, he, he'll sit there, you know, and he'll do his little handwriting work and, and, um, it's nice. So I have that help and, and that's it. You know, we go to the museums, we do so many things that involve learning. Like learning is not just sitting in front of a book or like in front of a teacher who's teaching you things. Learning is everywhere. Playing is learning. You know, I feel like play is so underrated as a learning experience. Like Todd, like when they were asking me when De I wish I would have known now, you know, I thought I was a new mom, but when Desmond was two and they were asking me when he's going to go to school, it's like, you mean go to the playground? Like, that's where he's learning right now. You know, he's learning social skills. He's learning how to set, set boundaries. He's problem learning solving. problem solving. There's so much to learn from playing. Um, and, and yeah. That's, that's, and that's not how our weeks go. We have like a field trip day. Um, we're always going to aquariums, museums, and there's just everywhere. Tell, tell them a little learning. bit about, you know, some of the programs that we are part of, the co-ops and things like oh, that. Oh, yeah, so I forgot can about know, that. Like, you know, kind of what to look out for. Okay, yes. So thankfully for us, we are very lucky we're, that we live in a city that it ha we got to look this up. But like, seriously, it has to be one of the biggest homeschooling communities there is in the U.S. There's Pretty no way good. because it's way bigger than Miami. There's no way. Um, But Tampa has a lot of homeschoolers. And so we have some really good co-ops. Um, here in this area. And now that Desmond is older and he's starting to know the things that he likes, he really likes science. Um, he really likes biology. He really likes engineering and anything, but anything where he's building things and making things. He likes art. And so, oh, I forgot to mention that too. So um, the, hard, the hardest part about homeschooling is having to organize all this crap, really, <laughs> because when they're in school, it's just all done for you, you know? But, like, it's like having to organize everyone's schedules and get them together is kind of hard. But so we have a group here um, that puts on a program called STEAM, and I'm sure you guys have heard of it. It's just science, technology, engineering, art, and math, and it's amazing. I pay a flat rate per semester, so it runs by semester. So we're in fall right now, and we have volunteer teachers we have perfect example um we have someone who is um one of their teachers the one that teaches them they're doing periodic table right now i think that that teacher is 
in his regular day job is like uh, is he's um either a construction worker he does something with construction so it's like that's perfect you don't have to be um i love when i get that question when i tell people i homeschool and they're like are you a teacher i'm like no <laughs> no because like you don't have to be a teacher to teach something you know what i mean like yeah. do i not know anything like well, why don't we tell them um i think there's there's no uh statistical difference um between parents who um went to college and parents who didn't go to college yeah for those that think that you're like too dumb or child's, something yeah. um homeschool education which Put that in the show notes. Uh, we need those homeschool statistics. Okay. There's also no statistical difference between a child whose parents spend less than $600 a year or more than $600 a year on education. So there's lots of really cool statistics. Yeah. That you so can don't look think at. that you have to be like one, super smart or two, have all this money like to or get a certification or, or like put down all this money for like programs or anything. There's actually no difference because kids are really good at learning, you know? They're very curious. Um, so, yeah, we have a really good. So Desmond will go to steam on Thursdays. I drop him off from 10 to 1 and he's there for three hours. He's got his friends. He's socializing. <laughs> he's doing what he loves. So and that's something that's awesome because we can tailor it specifically to him. You know, so now that he's getting a little older, there's more options for his age. So next semester, he'll be taking a few more classes. He says he wants to take Spanish and um, maybe this like Lego fusion class where they like build uh, things like trains and stuff with Legos. So it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. So I think, I mean, again, both of us are probably feeling like, oh, we, we, we missed so much, but there's just no way. There's no way we can get through more than what we did. I think it's a really good jump off point. We, for those who are interested, maybe some people aren't, you know, but for those who are, we are going to be doing deep dives into a lot of these things. I, I cannot wait for them to see, you know, Zach talk to us, Zach Slayback, Isaac Morehouse when we get him on, Anna, all these people where you're going to start to really um, question, you know, what your beliefs are. And you're starting to see like, wow, that guy doesn't sound like a psychopath. He sounds like a normal dude who's actually pretty darn successful. Um, it's not like these these weird hippies or or Christian fundamentalists or whatever you want to what, whatever your generalization of a homeschooler is. So. Yeah. And it's just also a lot of people don't think that there's all the options that there are, you know, like there's so many things like people think it's really hard, you know, you know what I mean? And it yeah. is, tr I mean, it's hard, but it's, it is hard, but they, um, I guess what, they, what I mean is like, they think it's like, there's not that many options, you know what I mean? So, and there are, there's so many options that are starting to become available for our kids, which is so exciting because it's just, it's just needed. Like this, this can't continue, you know? There's got to be options. So, yeah, we can't wait to get those awesome guests on. Um, you're going to really love it. And we're going to be able to dive a little bit deeper into different topics within homeschooling and unschooling and all this stuff. And I think you guys are going to really love it because that's how we learned about all this. And it was and learned about all these different opportunities. And we continue to learn. You know, I, I, I I'm selfishly saying that having our podcast is the biggest blessing ever. I was just talking to one of my best friends. I love it. Terry. Um, we caught up for like over an hour. Uh, Terry and I did today. That's awesome. I know. Um, and I was telling him like what a blessing it is to be able to pick these experts that I want to talk to and pick their brain. And I win because I'm getting this awesome information, but also anyone else who's interested wins because I'm putting it out there. So, um, Thank you all for all of the, wow, we've gotten a lot of really good feedback. And let's start reading some of these um, within the next couple of episodes, actually. So I think that the reason, by the way, I never told you this, but I think the reason that we can only see some of the reviews is because it only shows us people who wrote out a review. Oh, so the stars okay, are probably, you can, you know how you can just, you could just do stars uh -huh. or you could write something. So I think that. The written, like, because we only see those, I think that's just because those people wrote something and maybe the others just put star. But, anyways, we are so honestly, I'm blown out of the water because to me, I'm like my own worst critic. So I hear these podcasts and I'm like, oh, we got to get better, right? But, like, everybody loves our podcast. You guys are so supportive. Yeah. It's honestly, I don't even know what to say. Well, I've been, I've been really, I'm um, so surprised. I've been really caught off guard by, the things that people are saying because we're grateful. talking about the content but then you know a lot of people say you know what i just love the way you guys interact with each other there's a there's a mutual respect there's a 
there's uh there's you can tell you guys are a team and i've had <laughs> guy friends tell me that they their kids are treating them uh differently because they're acting differently towards their children love and it. their spouses i love it i mean oof, that's goosebumps you know i'm gonna read the first one because i want to get this party started and we'll read we'll read at least one or two every time but i want to read the first one and we'll cut this episode off okay? because I got another podcast to do. Um, <laughs> but I, it's so good that the first person, you're, you're going to laugh when you see who it is. Um, because this woman is hilarious. And oh, I know who it is already because oh, she's hilarious. Yeah. And she's my favorite. She's a, she's a huge supporter. So she says, the, the, um, the title is, I don't even have kids and I love this podcast. <laughs> so she, it's a five-star review. She says, probably my two favorite people in the Ketoverse, Danny and Maura, have been putting out amazing content all over the interwebs. And I'm so happy to see a podcast added into the mix. They are real, honest, and knowledgeable. But they aren't know-it-all judgmental ketoers. You hear real talk alongside compassion and understanding. Danny's low ego attitude paired with Maura's matter-of-fact advice. By the way, this is the second time she laughs. <laughs> At the low ego thing. <laughs> the first time it was way louder. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paired with Mauda's matter of fact advice <laughs> is an awesome balance. And she's very matter of fact. That's for sure. That is so funny. I am matter. Like, yeah. as a matter of fact. Yeah, she is very. That's what I love about her. Um, if you have kids <laughs> and are looking for real world examples of how to keep them healthy, this podcast is for you. If you don't have kids like me, it's still excellent content that's very listenable. Keto in Vegas. At love Keto her. in Vegas. And if you don't follow her, just do it because she's hilarious yeah and she she's does just these effects awesome, with her stories that are really freaking it funny. cracks me up and she's just cool and she's doing my glute program which is awesome and she's yeah she's killing it with that she's so, killing it thank you all again again subscribe um hit that five star you know if you want us to read it you know write something on there uh, you know be be witty and funny i like to be entertained while i read them so yeah. we're gonna start getting through these and um what else you got anything else before we well, yeah, I just want to say that at this point, anyone who's dedicated, I respect you for sticking through and listening to the entire song. Like that has to be like a thing. Like oh, I'm, yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah. The, I'm the really on a end. mission to find you guys some really good songs is that we are limited by copyright, but I'm trying to find some really cool songs to write out at the end yeah. and like see who's dedicated. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, I yeah. found this eight minute song the other day. I'm like, I got to see if I could use it. Cause yeah, do it. Chris is putting the whole thing. So, so. good. All yeah. right, guys. All right, guys. Well, we hope you enjoyed this and we'll see you next time. See you guys.